How can a poet describe the ultimate reality? How do you describe the really real, the most real thing of all? Of course, that's the difficult project Dante has set himself from the beginning of the Paradiso. But here, in these last cantos, as we move to the end of the poem, the demands and the difficulties and the impossibilities become even more acute. And we saw that in Canto 30, with the image of the river of light becoming a circle of light, and eventually a rose suffusing light and fragrance, a rose that's also a city, a kind of a stadium of the blessed that is the New Jerusalem. Now in Canto 31, Dante describes it as a, quote, holy legion, right? The church of the faithful is always to Dante a military force battling, and as the host of that, quote, Christ with his own blood had taken as his bride, right? The bride of Christ. Another host, the angels, swarm in as like bees, their faces, quote, living flame, their wings gold. When they fly into the rose, they share not pollen, but, quote, that peace and ardor which they had gained, unquote. It's the first time in the poem when these two words, la pace and la adore, are together. Divine love and peace pollinate the saints in heaven. The saints, in response, turn their sight and ardor, viso et amore, to that one sign, segno. Notice then that as the poem approaches the ultimate, Dante is stretching poetry, language itself, to its limits, relying almost exclusively on metaphor, simile, image. Only poetry, stretching language to its limits, can even approach talking about this ultimate reality. And what about the pilgrim's experience of all this? This, too, he must get at through simile, this time epic similes. Dante has us imagine a barbarian coming from the north, right, Helice, struck dumb by the sight of Rome and, quote, her vast works, especially St. John's Lateran, which at the time was a more splendid church than St. Peter's. If you can imagine this hairy barbarian coming from his huts in the northern German forests, you have some inkling, he says, of, quote, what amazement must have filled me, unquote, when, he says, he came quote, to the divine from the human, to eternity from time, and then reversing the order, he came from Florence to, quote, a people just and sane, right? Notice again how he changes that order. He goes, through, right, first from the divine things to the human, and then at the end he flips it from Florence, the human, to a people just and sane. I'm going to come back to that later. Then he tries another related image, a pilgrim who finally has reached the temple that he had vowed to reach, and in doing so, renews himself. Quote, he looks, Dante says, and hopes he can describe what it was like. I love this moment in the poem, for it's so human. Have you ever traveled someplace and while you were seeing it, you were already casting your mind forward, thinking, how will I ever describe this to my family and friends back home? The, the Grand Canyon was like this for me, right? Standing at the Grand Canyon, staring, thinking, I don't even know how I'll ever describe this to someone. So even in the midst of experiencing something wonderful, you're anticipating searching for the words to describe and explain it later, knowing that you'll never be able to do so. So here we have the poet describing the pilgrim, already casting ahead to the moment he'll be the poet, and already realizing he will, to a great extent, fail as a poet. So what does he do? He comes up with the image. He comes up with the simile of the pilgrim thinking these very thoughts as the way to describe what he cannot describe. And as he turns to Beatrice to speak to her about all he's seeing, he finds she's gone. And another, a new person, an elderly man, is there in her place. Now immediately, of course, we think back to Purgatorio 30, when Dante had turned to speak with Virgil, only to find him gone and Beatrice in his place. That time, a male guide, a poet, had given way to the female object of Dante's desire to lead him on his mystical journey here. Right? That time, a woman... This time, a woman gives way to a male contemplative, a kindly and tender father. This is Dante's last father in the poem, 
who prepares him to meet the final woman, the Virgin Mary. This older man says that, quote, Beatrice urged me to come to you from my place. That is that place in the rose. Just like she urged Virgil at the very beginning of the poem to come to Dante in the first canto so that, right, he could go on this journey. This time, right, Bernard has come to him so, quote, that all your longings may be satisfied. He's Bernard de Clairvaux, and while his appearance is initially surprising, the more you know about him, the more perfect he is as Dante's last guide. For this 12th century Cistercian wrote some of the most powerful, beautiful, deep, moving reflections on the Virgin Mary. He also wrote a commentary right, on the erotic love poem of the Bible, the Song of Songs, thus showing, as this poem has been showing us, that human desire, even frank and erotic, quite physical erotic desire, can and should be the richest doorway to our understanding of the love of God. So Bernard is the one, as Beatrice leaves Dante to take her place in the rose, who takes the love the pilgrim had for this very real, very human woman, and affects its final turn through Mary, another very real, very human woman, to God himself. Dante responds now with another startling image. He says he's like the pilgrim who's come from far away Croatia to come to St. Peter's to see the veil of Veronica. Now, if you remember the apocryphal story, Veronica, right, during the Passion, wiped the face of Jesus as he carried his cross to Golgotha, and the image of his face was preserved in her veil. This veil, which was in Dante's day one of the most sacred relics in the church, was regularly displayed in St. Peter's, where it was kept. It must have been stunning for believers. Just think in an age before photographs, to be looking at a miraculous, photographically realistic image of Christ, the second person of the Trinity, as he looked during this ultimate moment of suffering for sinner's redemption. And notice what Dante says, the pilgrim from Croatia can barely believe what he's seeing, repeating, quote, in his thought, the words, quote, O oh, my Lord Jesus Christ, true God, was then your image like the image I see now? Right? But let's go one step further. No one really knows what Veronica's name was. We think this was just a name created to convey the meaning here for her name, Vero Icona, right? Vero Icona, true icon, means true image. And the pilgrim says he was just like a pilgrim astounded at that, quote, true image of Christ as he looked at the li living love of Bernard, who, quote, in contemplation, tasted that peace. Bernard had visions of God. The poem is about to have a vision of God, but can only convey it to us through an image, through his poetry. The entire poem, that is, is an attempt to convey the true image of Dante's journey to see the face of God. We, on our pilgrimage of reading this poem, have been journeying like that pilgrim from Croatia. With our hunger to see what Dante has seen, we are hoping that in the next two cantos, we will see, get to see a true image of God. Will Dante be able to convey it? Surely not as fully as Veronica's veil can, right? Or maybe he will be able to. Will we sit there like the Croatian pilgrim saying, quote, is this what your image God looks like? Unquote. It seems that Dante has hinted here at the audacious project he has before him, the impossible task of this poem, and yet our longing as we get closer and closer to experience through his words that true image. Before leaving you, I just want to dwell on two more moments in this canto, moments that for me helped to sum up the whole point of the poem. Recall that Canto 30, even while describing the Empyrean, had ended somewhat shockingly with Beatrice returning to the final denunciation of Boniface VIII, the Pope who had double-crossed Dante. It's as if Beatrice and Dante the poet want to make sure that even in the Empyrean, we remember the sad, sinful, treacherous ways of humanity that need the purity of this vision, or else we would give in to bitterness and despair. 
Here in Canto 31, we have the last time in the Commedia where Florence is mentioned. And he uses it to contrast, remember, the just and sane people of heaven. So Florence endures one last condemnation, this time as an unjust, wicked, and insane city. Dante's traveled all this way, in other words, to find justice and sanity. And when he looks upon Beatrice and addresses her for the last time, he says he recognizes, quote, the grace and the benefit that he's received from being on this journey. Quote, you drew me out from slavery to freedom by those paths, unquote, he says, thanking her. The whole point of this journey and the whole point of reading this poem is to move in our own lives from slavery to freedom. The slavery that we saw every soul in the inferno was enmeshed in. The freedom the souls in purgatory were struggling towards. The freedom that the souls in paradise now have. Slavery to sin, slavery to ego, to selfishness, produces injustice and insanity. Only by recovering one's freedom can we live in justice and sanity. I know this poem is difficult and complex, and I still get lost in the details at times. But if you can stay focused on this, that the poem teaches all of us how to be truly free and how to find the just and the sane, you'll understand where Dante is trying to take you. And Beatrice, who is across the rose, as far away, the poem says, as the distance from the lowest depths of the ocean to the highest clouds, but can still be seen clearly, in the interesting world of paradise, right? She, quote, she smiled and she looked at me, unquote. It's the last time we see in the poem this woman who's driven all of Dante's journey. Now it's time to turn his attention beyond her. Bernard gazes at the Virgin Mary, the last mediator between the pilgrim and God, and Dante, in the last lines of the canto, turns his own eyes toward her as well. 